Joe Lynch. I'm the alumni director at Gettysburg College, class of 85. on uh, an important topic. And we are delighted today to both have uh, literature of the civil rights movement uh, as an example. And as a first year seminar, he's taught <clears throat> on black superheroes in American pop culture from Nat Turner <clears throat> to Netflix. And on top, he got his uh, BA at Duke University and PhD at University of Massachusetts. In addition to all these plaudits, he's also an extremely popular and excellent professor here because of his dedication to the students. Uh, his classes, because he's engaged with them, he's fantastic in the classroom. He's done a session, uh, probably somewhat similar to what he'll present today at both our alumni college and parent college uh, opportunities over the past couple of years. And I think especially for uh, those looking to learn more about racism in America uh, through the lens of poetry can be a very effective way to view it and to learn. So McKinley, we're very uh, thankful for your volunteering to do this. What we're gonna do is uh, McKinley's got about a 40 minute presentation planned. As a faculty member, we'll see if he can hold to that 40. Uh, and then we'll open it up the last 20 minutes to questions. If you do have questions during the presentation, we'll address them at the end, but feel free to put them in the chat function if you would like. Uh, that way we'll have questions teed up. Uh, he does have a presentation that he'll uh, be sharing his screen. Uh, so again, McKinley, thank you very much for uh, leading the session today and I'll let you take it away. Thanks very much. All right, so good evening, everyone. Um, I hope everybody's doing all right. I'm seeing some hand waves and some some smiles, so that's always a good um, that's always a good start. Uh, I am gonna try to share my screen, and let's make sure that that's working. Can everyone see that? Yes, I'm seeing some head nods. So excellent. Um, so I want to start off uh, just to kind of say a quick thank you. Uh, to Joe, of course, and to the Gettysburg Alumni Relations Office, um, and certainly to everyone who has uh, shown up here this evening. Uh, my understanding is Joe has just mapped it out for us all is that we will be ending with a Q&A and I am imagining that that will be a lot easier uh, with all of you all here. So really quickly, I'm going to ask everyone if you can mute yourself if you're not already muted just to make sure that um, you're not uh, distracting. Um, so if you would just double check that you're all muted and um, I'm gonna talk for a few minutes and then hopefully we're gonna talk for a few minutes and I'm gonna call this uh, at the end less of a Q&A and hopefully more of a conversation um, just cause I won't pretend that I have all of the answers to your cues, but I'll do my best to engage uh, some of your thoughts and responses. So uh, the class for today <laughs> for alumni college is titled Poetic Justice, Black Poets and the Movement for Black Lives. And I thought about this evening as an opportunity for us to collectively think about the relationship between art and activism. And so I wanna start by inviting us all to first think about the Black Lives Matter movement um, and to really start from the understanding that although this is a movement that has exploded in recent years and has certainly reached an apex in the forefront of our minds and in media in the past few months, it's really something that's about much more than just this moment, right? The issues that are being addressed and the ideas that are being discussed are not just about right now, but they have to be situated within a broader context. So for today, I'm gonna to invite you all to think about how the Black Lives Matter movement does three things. I mean, it does many things, but the three things we're gonna focus on today um, is the way that Black Lives Matter movement first looks back on history, examines history and examines traditions, um, also, secondly, offers a critical reflection of the present. And thirdly, seeks to imagine possible future. So if I can get a thumbs up, Kurt, I'm picking on you. Can I can see you? Is my screen moving now? You all see the next slide? It's not stuck. Okay. Yeah, McKinley, McKinley could, you, could you do the, the maximize in the bottom right? I think we'll be able to see everything better. Okay. Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So, um, all right, so I want us to think a bit about how the Black Lives Matter movement 
First, of course, looks at history. Secondly, examines and offers a critical response to the present. And thirdly, um, seeks to imagine possible futures. And of course, because of the topic for the day, I want us to also spend some time thinking about how Black poetry and Black poets do the same exact thing. So, in thinking about history, first, as we look back on how the Black Lives Matter movement and Black poets in correlation look back on history, I want us to think about the ways in which they offer a critical re-examining of history and of traditions, particularly with respect to our nation's past, and the historical treatment of black and brown people, understanding that the current moment is an extension of practices that have been central to the functioning of America from its very foundation, right? There are elements of this Black Lives Matter protest that are rooted in the idea that black lives have never been centered, they have never been truly treated as though they mattered, going all the way back to our nation's founding. And so a large part of what's being discussed now is not just what happened in June or what happened in January, but understanding how what happened in 2020 is rooted in longstanding traditions that go all the way back to the founding of our country. And so it's important as we think about this, as we you know, consider why it is that these monuments, for example, from the Confederacy that are quite literally monuments to white supremacy have come once again to the forefront in this moment that is supposed to be about very contemporary and very current issues. It's important to understand that these activists and the artists alike are thinking about the current moment by offering a critical re-examination of the past. It's not, however, all about critique. The reflection on history and the reflection on the past is also about celebration. And it's about how do we celebrate and how do we honor the freedom fighters, those workers for social justice who have come in the generations before. And so uh, on the slide here, I focused on three leaders that we've just lost in the past month. Um, Emma Sanders, who's, who is one of the founding members of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, as well as Reverend C.T. Vivian, and of course, John Lewis. And I'm gonna spend um, more time talking about John Lewis today, but I wanted to, to take a moment to just really remember and recognize that as we're losing these folks from the mid 20th century civil rights movement, it's important to understand how they're being talked about and how they're being reflected upon in this current moment and really how they're being understood as the intellectual and the artistic and the activist forebears to this current moment. So just last night, uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley made a comment referring to John Lewis as, quote, one of the original architects of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so this to me makes total sense when you think about who John Lewis was and how he entered into the national discourse as a part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, but most importantly, famously when he gave a speech at the 1963 March on Washington. And so uh, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom is of course most well known for MLK's I Have a Dream speech. Um, but John Lewis was the youngest speaker on the dais. And so in thinking through some of the issues that he was raising um, in giving that speech at the age of 23 years old in 1963, um, it's important to see exactly how John Lewis's words then became the precursor to much of what we're still having conversations about today. So among the many things that he addressed, he talked about the need to protect the young children and old women who must face police dogs and fire hoses in the South while they engage in peaceful demonstrations. He also talked about the importance of protecting the citizens of Danville, Virginia, and so many other towns across the United States who must live in constant fear of a police state. After addressing economic and political barriers to justice, he also demanded that the nation recognize that, quote, we are involved in a serious social revolution. He addressed those who failed to understand the urgency of the moment saying, quote, to those who have said, be patient and wait, we have long said that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. Lewis then offered this call to action. I appeal to you, all of you, 
to get into this great revolution that is sweeping the nation. Get in and stay in the streets of every city, every village and hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes, until the revolution of 1776 is complete. We must get in this revolution and complete the revolution. I want you all to take note of this idea that John Lewis in 63 is saying we need to complete the revolution of 1776. And some of that may help to um, flavor your understanding of some of the conversations that we had just this summer around Juneteenth and July 4th. And when do we celebrate a day of national freedom for this country, right? Eventually, Lewis closes his speech with this call. Wake up, America, wake up, for we cannot stop and we will not and cannot be patient. Now, in hearing these words, it's important to note that much of what John Lewis was saying in 1963 resonates powerfully with the demand of Black Lives Matter activists in 2020. Police brutality is not new. The demand that Black lives should matter is not new. But more importantly, it wasn't new in 1963 either. We celebrate figures like John Lewis now, but they were also standing on the shoulders of the activists and the freedom fighters who had come before them. There are many, myself included, who would argue that the movement for Black Lives started with the very first act of resistance from the enslaved Africans who fought back against their kidnappers, those who overthrew entire ships like the Amistad, as well as those who jumped overboard to freedom in order to save themselves and the children in their arms. Important for us to remember in this moment is that poetry has always been used in service of that protest. From the spirituals sung by enslaved peoples to the freedom songs that figures like John Lewis and Fannie Lou Hamer sang during the civil rights movement, to the socially conscious lyrics from hip hop that permeate our airwaves today, poetry has always been a part of the soundtrack to the movement towards social justice. Poets like Francis Harper brilliantly gave us images of enslaved mothers on the auction block in the 1850s. Poets like Sonia Sanchez and Amiri Baraka provided an artistic voice to the Black Power Movement in the 1970s, and contemporary poets are continuing that work today. In thinking about the historical arc of social justice movements and the role played by poets within that movement, I'm often drawn to an essay by Langston Hughes, which is one of my favorite works to teach, from 1947 called Adventures as a Social Poet. He writes about how he sees his work as part of an always activist effort. And he opens the essay with these lines. Poets who write mostly about love, roses and moonlight, sunsets and snow must lead a very quiet life. Seldom, I imagine, does their poetry get them into difficulties. Beauty and lyricism are really related to another world, to ivory towers, to your head in the clouds, feet floating off the earth. Unfortunately, Having been born poor and also colored in Missouri, I was stuck in the mud from the beginning. Try as I might to float off into the clouds, poverty and Jim Crow would grab me by the heels and right back on earth I would land. A third floor furnished room is the nearest thing I have ever had to an ivory tower. After discussing various incidents of being kicked out of multiple establishments, receiving hate mail and death threats for his political positions, and even being censored for performing blues poetry in the pulpit, Hughes concludes the essay with these words. So goes the life of a social poet. I am sure that none of these things would ever have happened to me had I limited the subject matter of my poems to roses and moonlight. But unfortunately, I was born poor and colored, and almost all the prettiest roses I have seen have been in rich white people's yards, not in mine. That is why I cannot write exclusively about roses and moonlight, for sometimes in the moonlight, my brothers see a fiery cross and a circle of Klansmen's hoods. Sometimes in the moonlight, a dark body swings from a lynching tree, but for his funeral, there are no roses. Now it's important to note here that Hughes is operating as an important voice within a historical tradition and how this helps us to understand poetry as a political tool. But what I also want us to take note of in these quotes is how Hughes positions poetry as a tool to reflect the realities of the present. The content of Hughes's poetry, he argues, is powerfully shaped by the reality of the life that he lives, the spaces that he occupies, and the images to which he has access. The relationship between his poetry and the material facts of his life cannot be ignored. 
This is the same argument that we see being outlined daily by protesters in the movement for Black lives. The advent of cell phone cameras, similarly to the effect of television cameras in the 1950s and 60s, perhaps best exemplified by the airing of the brutal Bloody Sunday on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, have helped us to reflect the material conditions of Black lives in real time. Social media has been used as a tool to make visible the complaints that Black and Brown people have lodged for decades. Twitter played a tremendous role in disseminating the video of the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, the young man who was attacked and killed while out for a run in Georgia. And we cannot overestimate the impact of the eight minute and 46 second video of George Floyd's suffocation in the streets as he called out for his mother. Today, we continue to be moved by video, often captured in real time on Facebook Live, of peaceful protesters being beaten and taken from the streets into unmarked vans. In this moment, when poets endeavor to create work that holds a mirror up to the world in which we live and the circumstances that we face, they are engaged in the very same work as these activists who feel it necessary to reflect and respond to the circumstances that make it necessary to insist upon the recognition that Black lives matter. The immediacy of this moment and all of the emotions that come with that sense of urgency is consistently captured in the work of contemporary poets. One poet, who I encourage everyone to check out, is Dominique Christina. She's a favorite of mine and of my students. And in one poem, Karma, she writes, we become poets in an attempt to tether words to righteousness our notebooks to social consciousness. And she writes, this ain't poetry, this is rage unmuted, a verb, a means, and an end. For more examples of this, I also encourage folks to look at Black Poets Speak Out. So I will say really quickly, I have compiled a resource sheet um, that is going out through alumni relations to all of the emails that you use to register. So all of these names and websites and articles and books are there for your further reading if and when you're ready. Um, but this is actually an amazing project, uh, hashtag Black Poets Speak Out, which uh, gathers several hundred contemporary poets who all begin their reading by saying, my name is I am a Black poet who refuses to remain silent while this nation murders Black people. I have a right to be angry. And so what's really amazing about this collection of work is that it's a number of poets who are sharing their own work, but it's also poets who are reading from their predecessors. And so they're really examining themselves within the current moment and offering their work as words for the current moment, while also inviting their audience to think about a tradition in which they're situating themselves. Um, okay, so uh, we've talked about how the movement for Black lives and the work of Black poets engages with history, both through critique and through celebration. We've talked about the need to grapple with the contemporary moment through work that reflects the reality of current circumstances. So next, I want us to think a little bit about how the movement for Black lives and the work of Black poets engages with the future. So much of the work that is ongoing in activist and artistic communities is about imagining alternative possibilities for alternative futures. The recognition that the conditions we face are deeply rooted in a very complicated history does not preclude the idea that the future might be something different if we take the necessary steps to intervene now. Activists who are seeking to defund or to completely abolish police forces, for example, are seeking to reimagine how this nation conceives of justice and how we need to think and rethink the processes by which people are granted or denied access to their full citizenship rights. The ongoing conversations around education, politics, economics, healthcare, et cetera, all seek to do the same. We have a past that we need to examine, we have a present that we need to confront, but we can have a different future if we do the work of imagining the possibility of something else. This again is where poetry comes into play. What better avenue for radical reimagining and restructuring of possible futures than poetry? Poets not only take on the world as it is, but they work to imagine it into the world that may someday be. For Black poets especially, the consideration of Black possibility, Black futurity, the encapsulation of Black imagination is also key to the work that they do. Now, I thought a lot about what poem I wanted to share with you all today. Um, and there's one in particular that's one of my favorites um, to teach by one of my favorite poets. Uh, this is a poet named Dines Smith. 
And this is a poem um, that I think does an excellent job of engaging with history, of confronting the present, and of imagining possibilities for the future. Um, this is not, of course, to say that there are not many others that we could have discussed, but I knew I had you all here for a limited amount of time. And so we're gonna focus on just this one. Um, the tome is titled Principles after JFK. Denez Smith is a genderqueer poet who identifies with the gender neutral pronoun they. They delivered this poem at the finals for Brave New Voices, which is a youth spoken word competition that some of you may be familiar with from the HBO series a few years ago. The finals were held in Washington, DC, and the organizers asked Smith to address the significance of holding the event at the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts in the nation's capital. And this was how Smith opened the evening's events. One. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask if your country is your country. Ask if your country belong to your country folk. Ask if your country addicted to blood. Ask if your country addicted to forgetting. Ask if your country an oil and power fiend. Ask if your country shake at night, starring for bodies. If bodies mean your country get to keep on being your country in the same old way. Ask if your country is built on stolen land and stolen breath. Ask if democracy is a chain tight as skin around your neck. Ask if your comfort means that elsewhere someone is burying a daughter. Ask if your comfort means that round the corner a man is dead because a cop mistook his body for a gun. Ask Ask if your comfort mean broke schools and food deserts on the other side of town. Ask if your new apartment used to belong to someone who couldn't afford to look like you. Ask, ask yourself if all the things you're scared to admit are shovels slowly filling a brown boy's throat too. All lives don't matter the same as all lives. Some lives matter only to ourselves. Some lives matter only in they hood. Some lives matter of fact and some lives up for debate. All lives, all lives matter to somebody, but what about this life of mine? honey colored and black as it is, what my life mean to you? Am I talking to you? Do you wish me justice or do you just wish I would just shut up already? Vanish already. Three, Diamond Reynolds is a hero where no one should have to be a hero. Steady as she be with daughter in the back seat, with Philando slowly becoming a memory right next to her, gun still pointed at his body, cop outside the window scared of a man he already proved to be a myth, thinking him zombie when he already imagined him go see diamond, be diamond strong in a world that treat our people like bad water. Diamond unbreakable, but why they test her like that? Why they send bullets through our bodies like they trying to see if we real or just a bad dream. Why they nightmare us into beasts. Why they comfort the cops and not the families. Why administrative, why administrative leave. Why they look up the record before they check the pulse. Why they, Why they spin the story before they call the ambulance? Why they more worried about getting caught than they worried about the killing? Why they protect and serve themselves from us? Why they want us to apologize for being in the way of their guns? What good is police? What is the American dream to a brown person except the dream of America leaving us alone? Four, 
I don't want America no more. I want to be a citizen of something new. I want a country happy for the immigrant hero. I want a country where joy is indigenous as its people. I want a country that keep its word. I want to not be scared to drink the water. I want a country that don't bomb other countries. I want a country that don't treat its people like a virus. I want a country not trying to cure itself of me. I want a country that treat my mama right. I want a land where my sister can be free. I want a country that don't look at me and my man and think about where and how we should burn. I want a nation. I want a nation under a kinder God. I want justice, the verb, not justice, the dream. I want what was promised to me. I want 40 acres and a boat that matters. I want no more prisons and a mule. I want all lives to actually matter. I want to be over race, but race ain't over me. I want, I want peace. I want equity. I want guns melted into a mosque or a church or a place for us to pray. And I wanna stop praying for my country to be mine for it to put the gun down, to take the bomb back. Five, hope is hard, but I have it. I look at my students' hands and imagine all that they will mother. Christ, oh name I was raised to pray to, oh Allah, sweet Lord of my father, Oh, all you gods of the homies and all the gods of strangers, work together. Build us into tools to build anything other than this world. Make us so that we may make us a world we can be grateful for and not grateful in spite of. Let us not be idle or stunned by fear. Let us not be so comfortable that we ignore another's grieving instead of ending what makes her grieve. Let us not be scared of the work because it's hard. Let us move the mountain because the mountain must be moved. Let us, O oh lords above us and within, let us be useful to our neighbors and tender their wounds. Let us be more bandaged than blade, unless the blade is needed. Let us be a sword against whatever does not bring us closer to home. Let us be dangerous to all that has failed us and bring us a world that is good to us. All of us, all us, all us, amen. So hopefully you all are understanding now why that's one of my favorite poems to teach. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the poem and then um, I'll try to, to wrap up so we'll have plenty of time for conversation. So um, there's a lot to unpack and a lot to talk about in this uh, seven minute poem. Uh, but the first thing that strikes me about the work is, of course, the opening line, which is Dinez's cleverly subversive response to the request to honor JFK. The most famous line from JFK's 1961 inaugural address, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, has become a hallmark of the servant citizen narrative, often used as a critique against any demand for the nation to offer recompense for legacies of oppression. And it is central to efforts at making policy in opposition to entitlements, an umbrella term that is all too frequently applied to basic citizenship rights. As oft repeated as this line is, however, its origins remain synonymous with JFK. Invoking history this way from the outset, the audience's familiarity with these words conjures association with the servant citizen narrative, in addition to the Kennedy brand of wealth, privilege, and Camelot, but also the Kennedys as outsiders, theirs as a family of immigrants, and to date, the only Catholics to ever occupy the White House. Smith, then, in their critical rewriting of the line, plays on the association with Kennedy while managing to flip Kennedy's demands of fellow citizens. 
examine yourselves, Kennedy suggests, to which Smith responds, ask if your country is your country, thereby demanding that the country itself should be under the microscope, questioned for its own history, its own traditions, and critically examined for a track record of taking and not giving. Denez suggests that the country is addicted to blood, to forgetting, to oil, to power, suggesting that the country's greed is more compulsion than choice. This poem is then a mandate for self-examination that is vital for the nation's health. What might be read as a virulent critique, I argue is better understood as an intervention, an attempt to disrupt the nation's self-destructive behavior and to break a cycle of addiction that leaves the country as broken as the communities that are trampled in its wake and kills America as slowly as any narcotic. Building upon the narrative of addiction, Smith also explores the numbness experienced by the privileged gentrifiers and those who remain blissfully unaware of injustices around the corner from them while the country digs itself deeper, piling the dirt into a brown boy's throat, effectively cutting off his air supply while also silencing him. This, the brown boy's silence, is compounded by the comfortable silence of those who are too scared to admit the truths that surround them. Denez's direct confrontation of silence is important here, where the reclamation of voice is a central aspect of the struggle for citizenship, but also for equality and personhood. Moreover, in the particular case of this poem, this silence of both white and brown bodies must be recognized within the context of a stanza that opens with one of the most famous lines from one of the most famous speeches of one of the most famous American presidents. Silence must be understood then as signifying upon speech by marking its absence. This silence is contemporaneous as well as predictive. It is the inevitable result of a brown boy's throat being slowly filled by shovels full of the fear-loaded silences of his fellow citizens, which is central to the sense that this first stanza is an intervention for the nation with dire warnings to be heeded for everyone involved. The threat of universal silence with all of its implications for a poem and a tradition in which speech suggests and conjures meaning is immediately pursued by Denez's invocation of the All Lives Matter battle cry. What's key here is that All Lives Matter is normally offered as a response, as a rejoinder to the initial protest chant that Black Lives Matter. In a reversal from the poem's opening line in which the primary part of a famous phrase is presented while its conclusion lingers unspoken, the second stanza employs a response as a means of invoking the initial call. Whereupon the protest anthem that Black Lives Matter is understood as a driving force of the stanza even as it remains unspoken. Denez intercedes in the battle between Black and all lives by settling into a series of declarative statements about some lives thereby insisting that the audience interrogate their own standing without the arguably more comfortable invitation to pick an already predetermined side, much like the civil rights anthem, whose side are you on, right? While Denez speaks of some, the audience is triggered to hear some in reference to all or black and to sit in their own discomfort about needing to make a decision as to where they align themselves. This implied choice becomes a direct demand as the stanza closes. No longer content to suggest that the audience ask yourself, Denez confronts the audience with a series of direct questions, concluding with, or do you wish I would just shut up already, vanish already? The stanza closes with the prospect of silence, thereby furthering the importance of speech and the power of oratory as an underlying concern of the poem. That this silence is linked with visibility and the prospect of vanishing goes even further in solidifying the connection between presence and voice and formally links the consequence of being shut up with the fate of being disappeared. Denez frames the critique of America within a rhetoric that forces examination of America's history as well as its present, but they also challenge the audience towards self-examination demanding that they critically engage with their own identities as much as they confront national character. In the poem's third section, Denez offers a third person narrative, focusing on Diamond Reynolds, who watched her partner Philando Castile bleed out after being shot in front of their daughter while complying with the police officer's demands. In the poetic meditation on the death of Castile, Denez commemorates him as a man whom the officer had already turned into a myth, thinking him zombie, when he already imagined him ghost. Denez emphasizes the loss that foregrounds or is at the backdrop of, depending on your perspective, this painful scene. Here, the loss is not only of Philando's life, 
but also of the memory of this man, as Denez not only captures the moment at which his identity becomes subsumed into the perspective of another, thereby costing him his life, but also predicts the inevitable loss of his legacy to a narrative that will continue to reimagine him and his existence after death. By employing a third person narrative, Denez forces the audience into the role of witness to the circumstances of the present in much the same way that Diamond herself tapped into the potential and power of witness by broadcasting the entire event live on Facebook. This case study in police brutality, as it were, is framed within a series of questions which once again place the audience in the uncomfortable position of facing the silence that comes with their inability to respond, sitting in a silence that comes with a question that demands a reasonable answer where there is none. These questions conclude with an interrogation of the American dream, suggesting that these are the ideas and concepts that must be grappled with in any black or brown person's effort to invest in the country that holds promise and potential for others while signaling pain and mourning for them. The American dream is an essential part of American national character and is the heartbeat of patriotic loyalty. Denez highlights quite clearly how difficult it is to place faith in that dream when the reality of one's existence as a marginalized person makes it far too difficult to grasp. As the poem moves forward, part four compounds this by suggesting the type of country of which Denez would be proud, a radical reimagining that considers alternate possibilities for this nation, one that is happy for the immigrant hero, where joy is as indigenous as its people, a country that keeps its word and doesn't bomb other countries. This reimagined country doesn't treat its people like a virus and is not trying to cure itself of me. This, Denez suggests, is a nation worth dreaming of, a nation that is worthy of patriotic fervor. In the concluding section of the poem, Denez's performance embraces a definitive tonal shift. In a poem that has been at times aggressively confrontational, mournful, prophetically declarative, the conclusion, the conclusion functions as an invitation that is as plaintive as it is hopeful. The timbre of Denez's voice in this final section calls for empathy and identification with their statements which might also solicit a retroactive agreement or at least an acknowledged recognition of the validity of the poem's preceding claims. The pacing slows, Denez's delivery seems all the more purposeful, fully communicating the added weight of the final statement. Here, we also see how closely the poem mirrors the arc of any memorable speech, such as JFK's inaugural, John Lewis's speech from the March on Washington, or even Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech. The poem begins with an opening, powerful opening line, includes a fevered pitch of a crescendo, and closes with a thoughtful suggestion of next steps and takeaways for its audience. In this final section, Denez suggests the personally fortifying power of hope, first being placed in the hands of their students and the belief in all that they will mother. This belief in students is then parallel to a faith in the divine, as Denez refers to familial history that includes both Christian and Muslim faith traditions before addressing the collective gods of the homies and strangers and the lords above and within. Ultimately, this faith in the possibility of the future is rooted in the demands that are placed upon the us and the we that drive the poem's conclusion. Denez demands, let us not be idle or stunned by fear. Let us not be so comfortable offering a clear rejoinder to the complacency of the poem's opening section. Denez further suggests, let us not be scared of the work because it's hard. Let us move the mountain because the mountain must be moved, eventually ending with a call to action, demanding, let us be more bandaged than blade unless the blade is needed, and let us be dangerous to all that has failed us and bring us a world good to us, all of us, all us. Remember, this inclusive command is an implicit response to the charge of the opening stanza, ultimately echoing and completing JFK's 1961 charge to the American people. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The poem's final lines do indeed suggest what the audience can do for the country to make it better. 
One might argue that everything in the poem has been a response to JFK's call, modeling and suggesting actions that could be taken for the country, as long as you recognize that addressing what's best for the country need not be at cross purposes with what's best for its citizens. Denez first critiques the country and initiates an intervention that demands a difficult look in the mirror, examining its history and reflecting its present, to face its addiction-fueled cravings while recognizing how it has hurt the people who now come to confront it. After the confrontation comes the invitation to join together with fellow citizens, or all us, to move the mountain that must be moved. Once this mountain is indeed moved, the ultimate goal is a world that is good to us and functions for the betterment of all us. It is at this point, and only at this point, that Smith implicitly invites the audience to offer an affirmative response to the charges of the poem, effectively joining to collectively voice the poem's concluding amen. Now, despite the fact that amen is usually the point at which we would conclude, I think that we do have some time left. All right, so I went for 43 minutes. I went like three minutes over, Joe. That's really good for me. That is extremely good for me. Um, uh, I think we do have some time for questions. And so I will yield to our moderators and to the chat room. Um, I hope that some of the points I made were useful for you, but I know we certainly did not exhaust um, everything that's happening in the poem. So questions about the poem, questions about Black poets, questions about Black Lives Matter. I think we've got about uh, 17 minutes. So uh, I will yield to the moderator. Well, McKinley, thank you so much uh, for that excellent presentation. Uh, certainly uh, eye-opening and impactful as uh, I expected it would be. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat room right now, but would like to unmute and ask, that would work, or if you prefer to put it in the chat room, uh, that should work as well. Hey Joe, I have a quick question. Go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, so McKinley, I, was just, I just would love to hear your thoughts more on, uh, I was kind of struck by um, the similarities between um, uh, some of the quotes that you had from Lewis and the the poem uh, by Smith at the end. Um, I was just wondering, and, and I know part of that was purposeful, but I wonder like what you feel kind of the um, the crossover is or what the specific uh, uses are of poetry versus let's say political speech and how they kind of cross over and, and interact with each other. Um, that's a really good question. So, um, this is one of the things that I spend a lot of time talking about. Um, I didn't mention this in the setup. I know Joe mentioned some of the courses that I teach. Uh, one of the courses that is one of my favorites to teach is a course called Voice and Visibility, African Americans and the Power of Spoken Word. And so the class itself is primarily one that focuses on spoken word poetry um, and pulls in some kind of lyrics from contemporary music and hip hop. But it's really a course that focuses on the oral tradition at large, right? And so it's a course that, kind of pairs poems with music, with political speeches, with various forms of oratory. Um, one of my favorite days is a day where we actually talk about the complexity of America, where we might look at a song like Nas's America alongside um, Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, right? And so I say all this to say as a preamble, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this question um, in terms of what it is that links these various forms of or oral cultural expression. And ultimately for me, it, it lies in the interrelationship between the speaker and the audience, right? The idea that um, there is always an effort by the speaker, whether you're using uh, kind of tried and true elements of call and response, whether you are playing to applause lines, whether you are waiting for the kind of amens from a congregation, if you're in the pulpit, but it's the idea that your work is clearly um, designed to articulate in a way that will resonate with an audience that is not just going to be reading your work on the page, but is going to be present with you. And so that idea of, of how do you stoke the energy? How do you pull on shared principles? How do you 
um, get people to invest in the ideas, the ideologies that you're putting forward um, so that you're saying something that both feels like this is a refreshing thing that I'm glad that I'm hearing, but also something that feels comfortable and feels familiar to me. Um, sometimes taking that thing that resonates because it feels so familiar and then upending it and saying, oh, I didn't expect that turn, I didn't expect that twist, I think is another um, kind of really strong um, oratorical skill that we see happening within the oral tradition. With John Lewis in particular, um, the speech that he gave at the March on Washington, I think was just a fascinating speech and I, I should have uh, brought the um, original text, but there were a few articles that were circulating fairly recently about um, the original speech that John Lewis was designed to give, was intending to give at the March on Washington versus the edited and kind of uh, toned down speech that he did end up giving. And in large part, he was again, the youngest one to speak. He was part of the Student Nonviolent Committee. He was 20, 23 and full of fire and, 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 and um, righteous indignation. And he came up against some of the older leaders who were saying, you know, listen, we've been trying to get this march going for several decades. We understand your fire, we understand your passion, but you have to understand that there are multiple audiences that we're trying to negotiate right now. And so that's the other piece. And I'm not here to defend the old guard in their toning down of his speech, because I thought his speech, quite frankly, was fire in its original form. But there is something to be said about how these how these artists, how these oral figures are working to navigate multiple audiences and how they play along with the different mediums that they're faced with, right? Understanding that I'm in a, in a room, in a coffee house with just, with just my community might shape what I'm able to do differently than if I know that this is on YouTube or if I know that I'm in an audience that I'm, you know, I'm coming to, for instance, I brought some of these poets to Gettysburg College and they may have said, you know, how is this going to play with this room and with this, you know, audience? Um, I'm going down a, a whole nother path here, but, you know, one of the other really interesting things about a lot of these contemporary poets is that many of them care less and less about audience. They care less and less about who's here. They're like, listen, if what I'm saying is bothering you, it doesn't negate the truth of it. So I'm not going to adjust it for you. I'm not going to tone it down for you. But there's still this kind of ongoing awareness whether it's an awareness to accommodate audience or an awareness to just say, well, the audience is gonna be uncomfortable and they'll just have to deal with it. There's still an awareness of how the words I'm saying are resonating. That is a central part of the oral tradition, whether you're talking about the blues or the sermon or a poet or a political speech. It's a very long-winded answer to your question, but. No, that's great. Well, Thank you, McKinley. <laughs> sure. And McKinley, I think we've got a good follow-up to that from uh, Jenica Bowman Lewis. Uh, who says, how are current poets such as Denez Smith connecting to and drawing from their tradition that I know you start with, with your students? Um, they are absolutely 100% grounded. Um, Denez Smith in particular is one that I often, part of the reason why I love teaching Denez's work is because of how many different things they address. Um, I mean, there are central ideas around black joy and black intimacy and love and um, I mentioned, you know, that Denez is a, you know, genderqueer poet who embraces a gender you know, neutral pronoun, which is, you know, in many, in many ways, the, the more kind of prominent use of pronouns is something new, but the identity of, of trans folks is certainly not. And so everything that they do in their work, as much as they are really positioning themselves as a 21st century figure that's grappling with 21st century ideas, they are tremendously rooted in all of the um, four fathers, four mothers, four bears that came before them. They're pulling from the traditions of the black church. They're pulling from gospel music. They're pulling from spirituals. They're pulling from blues and jazz. Um, you know, uh, another great example, the poet that I mentioned, uh, Dominique Christina, has an amazing collection of poetry out called Anarcha Speaks. And so for those who are unfamiliar, Anarka um, is the enslaved woman who was the kind of primary patient for Dr. Uh, J. Marion Sims, who is often known as the father of modern gynecology. And uh, he kind of earned this title, I'm saying earned in quotes, by doing um, experiments on enslaved women without anesthesia. And of course, because they were enslaved without their consent. And so Anarka was one of these women. And so part of what Dominique Christina does in this 
collection, which I think either came out in late 2018 or early 2019, is she very consciously and deliberately goes back to the period of American enslavement and kind of uses that as her context and using that as her time period, pulls from the language of the spirituals, pulls from the field haulers, pulls from all of these kind of oral traditions in, in a, as a way of creating a voice for Anarcha Speaks in this woman who has been rendered voiceless by historical narrative that has heralded this, you know, this man, this white man, as the father of gynecology at the expense of Black women's pain, right? And so I mention her because I think it's important to understand that all of these poets are not only mining historical resources for the stylistic choices that they're making, but also for the content of what they're doing and the characters that they're seeking to give voice to, the historical narratives that they're seeking to correct. And so there's stylistic and content elements that are absolutely all consistently reaching back into a past that has often been mistold, misrepresented, ignored, and rendered invisible. And so there's a political import even to the historical work um, that these poets are doing. I hope I answered your question. Great, and I think this is a good follow-up to that. This is uh, from KT Ewing, who says, out of curiosity, what other poets did you consider for this presentation? Ah, gosh. So um, Dominique Christina is always one at the top of my list. Um, Mahogany Brown is another poet that I was really thinking about um, whether I would use her work. There were, quite frankly, several poems by Denez that I was considering using. Another um, great poet, Clint, um, Smith, uh, who has this amazing poem called History Reconsidered that I thought about using. Um, quite frankly, there, I mean, there were just a really long list. I thought about some of the poems from Jericho Brown's The Tradition. Jericho Brown, for those who are not familiar, just won the Pulitzer for uh, poetry this year. He's the first um, openly Black gay poet to win a Pulitzer. And uh, there's one poem in there that's called um, Bullet Points, which is breathtaking. It's just an amazing poem. I mean, they're, it's a great collection. Um, I don't want uh, Jericho to hear I said just one poem. They're all great. They're wonderful. But that poem in particular is one um, that I really uh, I thought a lot about potentially using. But yeah, as I did mention earlier, I'm, I put together a resource list that will get sent out um, with a list of uh, a number of poets that I think might be some really great ones to consider for anybody interested in reading or, or knowing more about who in the contemporary moment is doing some really great stuff. Great. Uh, and then I think we've got time for probably one or two more questions. Uh, this has several uh, questions rolled up into it from Andrew. Uh, how do we navigate the blurred lines between representations of reality and raising awareness and the perpetuation of trauma and the objectification of black bodies and the sharing of violent videos. Is context the determinant or is such a rebuttal to the sharing another push to shunt aside the visibility of this brutality? That is a lot there. excellent question. <laughs> um, and I really wish I had an answer. Um, this is a thing that I have had many, many conversations with uh, various folks about um, personally, you know, one of the reasons why this poem in particular resonates so much with me is that uh, the poem that I talked about today, Principles, is because of the focus on Diamond Reynolds and Philando Castile. And for those, you know, there's some, I gave you some information um, in talking about the poem, but Philando Castile was killed um, by the police in his car and his um, daughter was in the back seat and his girlfriend was in the passenger seat. Um, and she recorded it and was uploading it to Facebook Live as Philando was dying. And that video, um, the little girl was in the back and she was just telling her mother, it'll be okay, mommy, it'll be okay, mommy. And, you know, trying to get her mother to calm down and to quiet her tears because she said, and I quote, I don't want you to get shooted, right? And so for me, that poem, that uh, video, took me completely out. Like I was, I was just, I was numb for hours and I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't do anything after watching that. And so that was the moment at which I decided personally, I'm not watching any more 
of the videos. So I have still not seen the George Floyd video. Just the description of it is enough for me. I haven't seen the Ahmaud Arbery video. I, I just personally, I've made a choice. I cannot watch them um, because I just, I don't think that I need the shock to my conscience. I think I already kind of know what's going on. And so I don't feel like I need to put myself through that emotional turmoil. That said, I also can't deny the fact that if Ahmaud Arbery's video had not gone viral, many of us wouldn't know his name. There would have been no you know, justice for him. There would have been no, I run with Ahmaud. There would have been none of that because he was, he was dead for weeks before his name was even familiar to people. Um, same with George Floyd. Those eight minutes and 46 seconds from everyone who's told me they've seen them are absolutely heart-wrenching. For me, just hearing that he called out for his mother was enough to devastate me because I am a, a self-confessed mama's boy completely. And so I, I felt that like literally in the pit of my stomach. I didn't have to watch it. But I can't deny the fact that the visibility of that video was a tremendous call to action. And so I guess this is a very long-winded way of saying, I, for that, I feel like for me, it's a personal choice. Um, I, I don't put myself through the emotional trauma of, of watching it, of watching them, but I cannot deny the impactful nature of sharing them. And so for me, I tend to try to share the story without the video. I figure people can always find the video on their own, um, but it's become a political tool. It's, a, it's, an, it's an organizing tool. And so I don't want to discount that. Um, I do think that there is a degree of kind of, you know, um, that there's something really morbid about the fact that we need these images for us to act. Um, but the reality is the images impel us to act. And what I'm mostly concerned about is the action. So, you know, I, I don't wanna knock it for people if that's, if that's what got you off your butt and into the streets. And if that's what called you to protest, then that's what called you to protest. Hopefully next time you don't need it. Um, but if that is what worked for you in the same way that, you know, images of fire hoses turned on children you know, um, got people active in the 50s and 60s. The pain of watching Bloody, you know, Bloody Sunday and watching John Lewis have his head bashed in on the Edmund Pettus Bridge called people to action. It, it shouldn't have taken that, but unfortunately it did. So what, whatever brought you into the fight, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're there and I hope you stay. Great, uh, great answer. Uh, why don't we wrap it up with this question from uh, an alumnus, Johan Run. Uh, who recommends everyone rereading and rehearing the poem, uh, Denez's poem, to fully appreciate it, uh, and says, uh, I'm worried that the Black Lives Matter movement is being viewed by many only through the lens of the presidential election campaigns, which I think might be interesting to comment upon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, uh, you saved that for the last question. <laughs> All right. So, and, and we don't really have to stop at 6.30. Uh, here's, here's, what I will, here's what I will say, and I will, I will answer that or I will respond to that by thinking back to, um, back to John Lewis um, and back to John Lewis's speech at the March on Washington, right? So, you know, the March on Washington was a march for jobs and freedom, right? It was a march that was about a full platform of actions that needed to be taken. And this is one of the things that John Lewis was saying in his original speech that he toned down, but he still effectively said in the speech that he actually delivered. This is just the beginning. This is not the end. This is not the end all be all. And so one of the things to keep in mind about the Black Lives Matter movement and the demand that Black Lives Matter is that it is about the entirety of Black lives, right? It's not just about police brutality. It's not just about violence. It's not just about political representation. It's not just about economics or healthcare or education. It's not about one thing. It is an entire platform that recognizes and understands that Black lives cannot matter until all of the things that are keeping them from being treated as though they do get addressed. And so it's a multi-pronged approach and your presidential vote is one part of it. Your Senate vote is one part of it. Your congressional votes, your mayors, your police chiefs, your local judges, your vote is but one part. Economic organization is another part. 
Advocacy in education and in healthcare is another part. And so the idea that Black lives have to matter in their totality in order for them to matter requires us to think beyond a singular issue or a singular action. Um, and so if voting is one of the main ways that you're organized and you're pushing, then absolutely do that, push and, and, and do the work personally. I've taken my primary you know, approach has been through education, but I try to make sure that education isn't the only thing that I do because that's not the only way, that's not the only space in which black lives don't matter. And so what I will say just kind of as conclusion is this is one of the reasons why I love dealing with poetry in specifically and literature more broadly is because if you really want to talk about how do you talk about people in the totality of their lives and all of the dimensions and complexities and nuances of their experiences of their histories of their narratives of their emotions of who they are and who they identify literature is always going to be an amazing tool that's going to get you to really push past all of these ways in which we are taught to not think of certain people as human and to not consider the totality of their lives. Literature is always going to be a really, really useful way to start thinking about humanity and to start really recognizing ways in which you never had considered that you didn't think of someone as fully human before, right? Pick up a narrative about immigration, pick up a narrative about race, pick up a narrative about sexuality and start thinking and, and, and recognizing how many preconceived notions you brought to the conversation that didn't allow you the space to think about the totality of someone, but you only thought about immigration with respect to immigration policy, or you only thought about race with respect to police brutality. Literature will get you starting to think about the whole human, the total human, and all the ways in which we have to kind of do the work that must be done, to quote from Dinez, move the mountain that must be moved to get us to really start thinking about why we don't recognize certain people as being human and other people as being fully attendant to all of the rights that come with that humanity. And one action isn't gonna get us there, whether it is one march or one vote. It's all gotta be a part of a, of a larger effort and a larger um, ongoing, I would say, conversation. Well, Dr. Melton, I can't think of a better way to wrap things up. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time, your insight, the, your ability to engage people virtually uh, was outstanding tonight. And being in person with students here in three and a half weeks, I know you're very much looking forward to it. We're delighted to have you back uh, on campus after your year at JMU. Yes. Uh, thanks so much to everybody for taking the time this afternoon to join us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation and we will continue to, to offer things virtually uh, because we're not ready to gather publicly as a, an alumni group yet, uh, but uh, we are looking forward to school classes starting August 17th. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, McKinley, if you wanna boost your ego, feel free to stick around and read some of the chat. I will. Uh, <laughs> thank you all so much for coming. Appreciation. Um, and for your energy and attention this evening. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much.